Out of the street corners they scream. You knew it was coming. You've been waiting for this for months. Rumor hardened into fear and now they scream at you. The sirens, their hysterical wail tearing through the white noise of the city. And you run. You run to pick up those things that can never be replaced. A picture of them in the days when they still loved you. Your mother's wedding ring. And then you turn to your shelf of games. You only have room for five. Five games for Doomsday. Five Games for Doomsday is a show in which board game personalities are thrust into a cabin in the woods to outrun an oncoming disaster, but can only take five of their games with them. But which will they choose? My guest this week is a writer, game designer, dramaturg, podcaster, and factotum of the weird and macabre. He's written countless RPGs, including Call of Cthulhu D20, the Dresden Files RPG, the Dracula Dossier, and Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. He's written books on the Nazi occult, and helped to mount a production of The Shadow over Innsmouth in his much-beloved home of Chicago. He also dispenses weekly prescriptions of creative purgative to blocked gamers in his podcast Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff. My guest this week is Kenneth Height. Ken, welcome to the cabin. Oh, thanks for uh, thanks for opening the door and letting letting me in. Well, it was it was either that or listen to your screams as you were torn apart. Yeah, that and that, frankly, that puts you off your soup. Absolutely, a bunch of tear apart screaming. So, um, firstly, how difficult was it for you to choose? the games to take to the cabin was it was it a wrench or was it relatively easy it was it was i want to say nearly impossible um if you not just love games but do them professionally you're already doomed because you're like well i don't want to take a bad game to the cabin and even if it's a fun game that people have played for generations you're like i'm not gonna show up at the apocalypse cabin and they'll be like monopoly get the hell out of here we hate you go back to the mutants um and and so you have to sort of try and balance quality with uh, replay value. I mean, because there's a ton of games that are just amazing, but you've played them and you've shot your shot, right? They you, you can't be replaying them endlessly after an apocalypse. So there's there's just a ton of criteria, and they all you know just messed with my head. And finally, I just um, uh, I grabbed the five that I got here in my arms and and hope that and hope for the best. I mean, to what extent is it a job of curation, saving what's worthy for future generations? I mean, there's an extent. I mean, that's part of the don't show up with a bad game to the cabin question. And then part of it is, you know, what do you uh, what do you need to do in an apocalypse that maybe you don't need to do in um, uh, in a regular world with only moderate apocalypse levels? And, you know, to what degree was is there a nostalgic sentimental attachment to the choices you're bringing are you a sentimental person i mean i'm i'm no uh i'm not super sentimental but i'm not a, a robot i have connections to people and things uh, i think one of the choices i made is is probably strongly driven by sentiment and then the others are uh more affection than sentiment if i can parse that uh, ridiculous dividing line right and I, I always want to ask this because I, I play RPGs, but I'm primarily a, poor, a board gamer that plays RPGs, basically mm-hmm. because I'm an out-of-work actor and so I need, you know, something to exercise those acting muscles. Right. And it's a question I always ask RPG people. How important are the mechanics? Can you kind of play any game with a basic system of resolution or... You know, are there are there games that you can't divorce from their mechanical content? I mean, there's plenty of games you can't divorce from their mechanical content. That's what good design is: is that the mechanical content feeds uh, the the happening at the table. And um, it is true that because so much of a role playing game is the emergent property between game master and players, uh, in ninety percent of the cases, yes, yes, we all know about game masterless games. Back off, but the that emergent quality amongst the play group is so much a larger part of the role-playing experience than it is the board game experience that you can, in fact, run a great role-playing game with garbage mechanics. But why should you? It's like, can you have a good meal at McDonald's? Sure, if everyone there is already drunk and super happy and likes each other. But that's not your thinking, well, since I can just eat anything, I'm going to shovel cardboard burgers into my mouth for the rest of my life. That's 
That's not the way that we do anything. So why would we, can you dance to bad music? Absolutely. I've danced to bad music, but you'd rather listen to good music. Same thing with role-playing and the mechanics inform what happens at the table or else they're useless mechanics. So, uh, again, there are ample examples of bad games with mechanics that do nothing but slow down play. Those are bad games. Um, but there are so many games and ever more because we're in a golden age of role-playing game design, uh, ever more games in which the mechanics actually create a surprisingly nuanced set of emotional interplays, or at least provide the seed crystal or the catalyst for that set of emotional interplay at the table that you would never look at a game, uh, and then say, well, I can, I can play star crossed with just, a another person and, um, uh, and a randomizer because it's not the same game. You can't play uh, Call of Cthulhu without the death spiral. If or if the GM's like, no, I'll just say, yeah, every so often you'll you'll lose some sanity. That'll work just as well. That's not how that's not how games work. Not how role playing games work. Certainly. And I mean, so to what degree are the mechanics of a game? I I guess I guess when you think of role playing games, they're made up of two parts: role playing mm. and game. Yeah. How important is the game aspect? What what differentiates an RPG from an impro session? Well, uh, usually rules, um, <laughs> but uh, often rules and dice is what uh, differentiates that. And there are certainly armies of people, and I know it happens in Australia a great deal uh, and in Scandinavia, where the rules and the dice exist, but they exist ritually they don't really constrain play but the free form play happens within knowledge of that rule set uh and you, it is very much like an improv session but it's an improv session where everyone knows the same boundaries if you will um and and, and moves within that same space uh but m most games played by most people uh yeah the, the the game absolutely informs it because there is also a did I win component and you need a randomizer and you need a system to understand that as opposed to just a hey, I, I felt like I was in a winning place um which is great uh and certainly it's great if you don't intend to ever um uh uh feel like the contest is in doubt uh but uh, I think that feeling like the contest is in doubt is a gigantic part, not just of gameplay, but of narrative. So why not have that? And I want to briefly, because you're, you're an RPG expert, one, and I'm a sort of occasional RPGer, and one thing that seems to annoy me, and <laughs> you discussed it on your last, your last um, podcast, episode was this notion that people talk about railroading mm -hmm. and how if you try and encourage a storyline onto your players you're somehow robbing them of agency and it seems to me that it's the story that people jump into the game for how much do you agree with that and do you think railroading is just a myth well i mean there is a set of behaviors by uh, frustrated novelists who happen to be game masters that has been described as railroading in which you are sitting at the table to hear me tell you a story and occasionally you will roll dice to determine how many orcs you killed during the story. That is, by and large, counterproductive gameplay and it's certainly crippled gameplay because you're not getting everything you possibly can because you're losing a ton of the interactivity that makes role-playing uh, uh, its own medium. Uh, but... Many people take that observation, and and I know you're going to be amazed that people do this, because they'd never do this in any other aspect of the world. They take one thing that's bad, and they generalize it to a whole bunch of other phenomena that have nothing or very little to do with that phenomenon. So uh, they say any game in which there is a defined endpoint must, uh, must be railroading, and it's like, no, that's a game that has a goal. That's throwing the room into Mount, the the ring into Mount Doom. That's solving the mystery of who killed Roger Ackroyd. That's narrative. Um, that's getting home to Ithaca. Uh, if you're doing the Odyssey and you're not getting home to Ithaca, then that's not the point of the Odyssey, right? You're you're doing something else. You're doing ancient Greek uh, dun uh, sandbox, which can be fun. And there's nothing wrong with pure sandbox play, uh, iterative, picaresque. Decide what you want to do on the moment. Random choices uh, inspired by what you had for lunch that day. 
great. But most narrative that we have spent the last 5,000 years constructing has an endpoint. And so imposing even that minimal quality on a game is often seen as railroading. And that's, and that's, that, that waters down what might have been once a useful prescriptive term to describe one narrow type of bad GMing. And now it's um, uh, just sort of been generalized out of all usefulness, which is, you know, kind of a shame because the original term did describe a thing that did happen, especially with a lot of people uh, who either were frustrated novelists or it was their first, um, uh, their first time, um, you know, GMing or their first couple of times. And they were like, oh, this is just how we act out movies. And it's not just how you act out movies. And that's, you know, either, you know, ignorance or, or willful malfeasance is, are both bad, but they're not even the same kind of railroading, much less is every other kind of dysfunctional uh, GMing railroading. And certainly not functional GMing that someone just happens to disagree with because they're the kind of person who told this is an, an Odyssey game refuses to have anything to do with Ithaca. Yeah, and I'm very much of the opinion that one or two sessions of bumbling around ye olde Tesco is wonderful. But when it starts to happen every week and when you try to impose a storyline, people accuse you of railroading, it becomes a little frustrating, right? So I want to go back to the beginning. So when did games and, and when did RPGs enter your life? Has this been a lifetime pursuit? Um... Well, I mean, it hasn't even existed my whole lifetime, but I discovered Dungeons and Dragons in 1977 and, uh, like a lot of people, uh, fell immediately in love with the concept. And then unlike most people who fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons in 1977, I just never stopped playing. Um, I had a friend who loaned me the monster manual. That was the first D and D thing I ever saw. And I spent all summer just making up monsters. And then when I came back to school, really excited about this monster manual book, uh, another friend said, Hey, that's from Dungeons and Dragons. I have this. And it was the, uh, the little Holmes basic set. I have this, let's play Dungeons and Dragons. You've got a monster manual. I've got this, let's play. And then we eventually figured out, Oh, there's more, there's an, an AD and D and how does that fit in with our blue thing? And we figured that out sort of for ourselves. And then eventually AD and D, all of it was present in its glory. And, uh, we switched over and played that very, very happily. Uh, and then in 1981, uh, uh, the good Lord revealed, uh, his servant, Sandy Peterson's call of Cthulhu unto us. And I just played that, uh, pretty much constantly for the next probably 20 years and would still be playing it now if it weren't for the fact that I have a, a very strong, very great, very gifted, very beloved member of my game group who has a severe Lovecraft allergy and just won't countenance it. So we had to figure out other stuff to do, which is great because there's a million other things to do, but uh, it is it, it is always the dream that you shoot for is to recapture those uh, those first batch of Call of Cthulhu sessions where everything was was wonderful and new and working perfectly. I mean, did you consider yourself a sort of fully invested rpg -er before Call of Cthulhu, or was it Call of Cthulhu that really sort of sunk itself? I mean, I think it's like blood? It's, it's like you know, do you think you're a music fan before you first hear that band, whatever it is for you? Yeah, of course you do. You're like, I like music just fine, and then you hear, you know. Uh, Bruce Springsteen or, or whoever it is that, you know, comes along when you're 14 and half full of wild turkey and you're like, this is the greatest thing ever. And yeah, but Call of Cthulhu is like that. It's just that Call of Cthulhu is actually the king lear of the art form and the greatest game ever. So, uh, you know, it's like if you actually your first band like that was The Clash. And you were like, oh, well, there you go. I'm done. I've, I've, just, I've discovered the only band that matters. Um, so the... Uh, so yeah, I mean, I thought I was a a, 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 a game. I mean, I knew I was a gamer. I was brought up to be a gamer. My whole family played board games all the time. Santa Claus brought us board games for Christmas. Uh, that was game night was a standard thing at the house. I knew I was a gamer. And then discovering that there was this new, exciting, fun kind of gaming, I liked that best. And then Call of Cthulhu sort of, you know, was the thing that established what the art form could be for me. And I've been chasing Sandy pretty much as player and creator ever since. And so, by this, it sounds like that you were around during the Satanic Panic of the 1980s. Oh, I, I lived in Oklahoma. I was ground zero for the Satanic Panic, practically. I mean, two questions. I mean, firstly, were you one of those kids who grew up in an intensely religious household and parents tried to whip your, you know, player's handbook away from you? And 
was the sort of transgression of playing D and D a draw to you, or playing RPGs in general? Um, my family uh, was Presbyterian, and uh, Presbyterians have not engaged in moral panics uh, since uh, we. Uh, uh, persecuted witches in the 16th century and got that out of our system and have never done it since. Uh, Presbyterians sort of tut tut about other people embarrassing themselves by going into a moral panic. So that was always the attitude in my house. I certainly had players whose parents were very against them playing Dungeons and Dragons. I had one player, in fact, who had got to utter the immortal, oh, don't worry, it's not Dungeons and Dragons, that game with demons. This is Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> And, and so we, we had that good fun. And um, uh, my father at the time was the county chairman of the Republican Party in Oklahoma County. And so he would get literature from all kinds of concerned parent groups uh, to display at the at the convention. And uh, one of the groups was asking about various kinds of literature. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And they said, and we have a pamphlet about how Dungeons and Dragons is satanic. And he says, great, I'll be sure to give one to my son, the Dungeon Master. And I, I, to their credit, they brought the pamphlet anyway. And to his credit, he get, did give me the pamphlet. And to my credit, I passed it out of the game and said, you've all been warned. Let's go. And I mean, how important do you think that famous chick tract was to making D&D the legendary sized game that it became? I mean, D&D was legendary before there was a satanic panic. And the reason it was a satanic panic is because hacks like the mazes and monsters guy and idiots like the journalists who wrote up the first Dave Eggers case needed a hook to hang a sad story about a teen with emotional problems on and picked a gigantic fad. And similarly with video games, no one was worried about Pong. People got worried about video games when it was a billion dollar industry and there was money in suing them or money in going to the church and saying, you don't know what your kids are doing, which literally people were doing you know, the second cave in existence, someone was coming over to the first cave and say, you don't know what your kids are doing. They're into that red ochre paint. They're making buffaloes. That's against the ways of the creator. And this is just a natural human impulse. But Dungeons and Dragons was just fine before the satanic panic. The reason the satanic panic got traction is because it attached itself to this cultural phenomenon. And yeah, I'm not saying there was nobody ever who, you know, in the depths of Mississippi or somewhere started playing D&D &D because it was cool and transgressive like heavy metal i'm sure that lots of people did that but they would have been playing D, &D anyway because they were the cool metal kids and that's who played D, D, right it was it was the stoners in the chess club that was who played D, D, and so they absolutely would have gotten into it with or without satan and so how different were these games back then in terms of mechanics? So I've read this book of Dyson Men and he talks about an experience he has when he goes to Gary Con and plays first edition D&D &D and it seems almost without incident in his, in his uh, explanation, more of a cartography exercise than a role-playing game. I mean, how different were they mechanically and how was the style of GMing different back in the well, I mean I am not John Peterson or James Malashevsky, so I have not done the archaeology that these guys have done. Um, and there are groups that legitimately like their, you know, Baroque recreation orchestras, and they go and they play Bach on the instruments from the 17th century, which sounds like a very hard way to have to play Bach. Similarly, playing Dungeons and Dragons using the Blackmore technology from 1975 seems like a ridiculous exercise, given the limited amount of free time anyone has. Um, but I'll bet if Dave Arneson was your GM, that was terrific. That was a great time. And we know it was because literally everyone stopped playing every other game they were playing and begged Dave Arneson to run more of his new game, which was not yet called Dungeons and Dragons for them. Um, that's how we know it was better than other games is it blew up and became gigantically successful. And kids like me that were perfectly happy playing chess and backgammon and Gettysburg stopped it all and played nothing but Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, you know it was great. And the the notion of a modern gamer trying to go back and wear those clothes and play that game, first of all, that sort of, you know, historicism of it is going to get in your way because no one at, in 1975 was being historicist. They were living. Um, so it's it's already a, a ridiculous, ex not a ridiculous exercise, but a an exercise that can only go so far. And then... To have them, uh, and to have someone who's running the game who is treating it in the same sort of 
almost like ritualistic or archaeological or, 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 or like a, like a church service. Well, yeah, it's probably not going to be the ideal uh, D&D table. Um, but again, John Peterson or James Malashevsky would know a million uh, uh, more points of data than I certainly do because I was just alive then and it all seemed great. I've, I've been playing great games ever since I was playing games. And uh, maybe that's because I've been running them since about 1979. But uh, they, they've all been terrific. I've, I've never at one, at one point ever said, oh... Uh, gaming got better, it, it, except again when you run into a design that is just so amazing uh, that that it alters things you think you can do at the table. And those are games like uh, Call of Cthulhu or games like Dogs in the Vineyard that that really open up a whole new universe to you uh, in terms of oh, you can it's in counterpoint. Someone thought up that in the medieval times, and then music changed utterly. It's the same sort of thing. But people were still singing basically the same way they were before that. And so when did you start to think that you could create games as well as just play them? Or was that right from the off? I mean, that's right from the jump because that's what Dungeons & Dragons is. There's a whole section in the back of the DM's guide that's how to roll up your own random dungeon. And they're assuming you can create games. And because Gary, God bless him, couldn't edit his way out of a paper sack, you had to create most D&D games, if only to say, well, we certainly aren't using the psionics rules. <laughs> and then... Um, uh, the, the, you had to sort of cobble together, like I talked about, we built our first D&D &D game out of the advanced monster manual and the blue book and try and figure out where those overlaps laid. We played a sort of a hybrid advanced basic for a while. Everyone who plays those games is always uh, house ruling and, and being a creator in some way. And then just the notion that you could create your own scenario is like baked into the process. And then the notion of this is D&D &D except... There's no elves, and we have guns, and I figured out how guns work. I think that was probably the third D and D table did that. So it's very much, you know, I'll bet the first one did because I think there were guns in the first D and D. But uh, the, uh, but but that you know sort of process is inherent in the hobby, and that's one of the things that makes it so great is because it has such a not just a low barrier to entry, but it's it's like everyone who ever heard rock and roll was basically invited up on stage to play with you know Mick and Keith. And then you are the books say, get up on stage, play with Mick and Keith. And so what was the first thing you had published and how did you feel to actually make money for writing something role playing? Well, I'm a big fan of money. Um, that's for sure. And uh, writing games is easier work than any work that I've ever done. Uh, it's still work, but, uh, but I, it, it beats the hell out of spreading blacktop. Um, but no, it, I, my first publication was probably GURPS Alternate Earths, although it might have been my contributions to the core book of Nephilim. Uh, and they came out sort of in parallel. A bunch of my gamer friends, when I was in grad school and they were in college at the University of Chicago, would sit around and bounce alternate histories off of each other as fun during meetings of the Science Fiction Club. And Steve Jackson Games at that time had a list of things we want on the internet uh, this was very early in the history of the internet and you would um, uh, be able to log on and, and go to their uh, web page very early in the history of web pages and, and look it up. And uh, if they, if you wanted, you could write away and they would send it to you in an envelope like primitive times. And uh, they, they had a game called GURPS time travel that had come out and we all thought, Oh, that'd be fun if we did our alternate histories, but for GURPS. And so I wrote a proposal and sent it off to Steve Jackson and Steve promptly lost it and forgot about it for years. Uh, roughly in that same time period, one of my old Call of Cthulhu players from high school and college got a job at Iron Crown uh, Enterprises and got a hold of the playtest manuscript of Nephilim. He sends that to me because he figures who better to deal with a game of black magic and conspiracies than his old Call of Cthulhu keeper. And so I looked at that manuscript and I wrote about 11,000 words of back sass and I sent it back to, uh, uh, I forget if it was him or, or, or just to chaosium. And then I got an email from Greg Stafford, which it, again, even in those days was like getting an email from the prophet Isaiah. And he's like, uh, this is terrific. Uh, here's what we're going to pay you to use it in the book. If that's okay. What's the next book you're going to write for us. And you know, when Greg Stafford reaches down out of heaven and touches you, you're a game designer, whether you wanted to be one or not. And so I said, I'm going to write the Secret Societies book for you guys next. And that's what I did. And 
So secret societies, GURPS alternate earths, because Steve Jackson eventually uncovered the proposal from the drawer that he'd accidentally filed it in. And he said, oh, this is really great. I'd, I'd, I'd like four of them. And so uh, me and my partners got together writing uh, GURPS alternate earths. Those all came out sort of in a flurry right around 96, I guess, or 97. And then I had enough publication and, and Chaosium kept wanting more stuff and Steve Jackson kept wanting more stuff. And I started doing it in, you know, my spare time after uh, the office. And my wife, uh, perhaps foolishly, said, you're a lot happier writing games than you are working for an insurance company. Why don't you do that full time? And despite it immediately proving to be a terrible idea, um, she stuck with it and I've stuck with it. And then it has slowly become a less terrible idea year on year. And now I'm unsuited to do anything else. I'd have to tell people I was in prison if they asked me what I was doing with this giant, you know, 20 year gap in my, uh, in my uh, resume. So I want to go to your first game now, and this isn't an RPG. This is a board game. Right. And this is a world at war. And so most war games sort of focus on a battle or a theater. And this seems to look at sort of every aspect of the second world war from the politics down to, you know, provisioning the troops right how yeah. well does it do this well i mean uh this it, it 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 comes out of the dna it's basically a much bigger version of the classic john prados game third reich and i have not played a world at war all the way through even once uh because giant board game uh but I've played Third Reich more times than I think most people on the bell curve of people who've played Third Reich. And I love Third Reich. I think it's exactly the sort of, like you say, it's the meatiness of it that I love. It's the I love big strategy games. The bigger, the better. I'm, I'm not very excited. I played a ton of Squad Leader when I was younger, and I think that burned me out of, of tactical skirmish games probably forever. Uh, I, I can still play them. If they're good ones, I'll enjoy them. But my blood gets pumping only if we're sending divisions and core places. One guy to take a hill is not super interesting to me. Uh, a division to take the Ukraine, now we're listening. Um, so, or uh, an army group to take the Ukraine. But uh, but World War is like the uh, multiply play-tested, expanded, uh, both theaters of operation version of, of Third Reich. And... The reason that you take that is because, I mean, if you're if it's the apocalypse and we got nothing to do with play games, we can finally get a good monster war game session, and I don't have to break out four separate Saturdays. It's like we got nothing else to do. We're going to play a world war, and as you say, it's so complex that just you know the the act of play is going to be uh, uh, fully educational and entertaining here in the in the in the bunker. And so. I, I've had a few war game players and a couple of war game designers. I've had Mark Herman on the show. Right. And I oh, almost, what a, what a, what a, he is, he is almost single handedly responsible for the revivication of the art form, Mark Herman. And it, an incredibly so interesting man. Yeah. Um, so how do war games enhance our understanding of history? Or is that not their purpose? I mean, I think that it's an ancillary purpose. I mean, their purpose, like all games, is to, um, uh, is to express some sort of uh, of of artful competition, and games can be as, as uncompetitive and as unartful as they want. But that sort of moment of gameplay, that homo ludus aspect, that's its real job, regardless. And there are many war games, yes, that are so caught up in being a simulation that they're terrible games. You you get a game that's about some incredibly one sided battle, um, and uh, uh, and the and the designer is like, well, that's how it came out. That means the game works. Um, but I think the good games are the ones that, even if they're simulating it, are teaching you why that game came, why that battle came out that way, and what you had to think about. But the best games are ones that take a ludicrously one-sided struggle, like the American Civil War, and they, uh, while maintaining the simulationist quality of it, leave it as a playable game, and that might just be. If the South holds on until 1867, that's a victory um, because, you know, the South was doomed no matter what happened. But, you know, you, you can just recalibrate the victory. I At the moment that people discovered that, which I think, I guess, was probably Panzerblitz era, that was a big change for, role, for war games as well. It used to just be last guy on the board, you won. And too bad if you were playing Gettysburg. Um, but the, uh, but the, the notion of the, of the variable victory scale uh, is, is pretty uh, fascinating. And, and once you've introduced that, 
you're able to combine simulation and play in a way that maybe you weren't before. Uh, but I think a, a war game that forgets it's about the play and only thinks it's about the simulation is not going to get the replay value that something like Third Reich or Russian Campaign or, or a lot of really great games or Mark Herman's games have. And so what is it, do you think, that we find endlessly fascinating about the Second World War? It, it seems that it, it's the war that is, is, I mean, amongst war gamers, you hear them talking, it's the most popular war that they like to immerse themselves in. And every year, a thousand books come out about Nazis, and, and you've written one yourself. What mm. is it about the Second World War that has a grip on I mean, that sort of social interest? I mean, part of it is that it's recognizably modern, right? There's cars and planes and everything that we have in the world. There's not the internet. So maybe that's what's going to happen is that that first pure internet generation is now, you know, in their thirties, I guess. And then they're going to have kids and they're going to have kids and their kids, kids are going to be, why are we caring about a time when no one had the internet? That's stupid. And so they'll finally be playing about, you know, Gulf war four or something. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's a recognizable world, but it's also an apocalypse in the way of all, religious and literary apocalypses. So it's your Lord of the Rings. It's your book of revelation. It's hell letting out for breakfast. So it's big scale, big scope. It, it hits that adrenaline and it's just, you know, like every human activity, but more so when human activities involve killing people, it's just fascinating. You, you if you're a, a pacifist, you sit there stunned and amazed that people could do all that. If you're a warmonger, you sit there jealous that people got to do that but either way you're totally involved and totally invested and you know it's a, as close as you get to a story of good versus evil you know this side of the bible um because the nazis were super evil and they went out of their way to be super evil and they are so evil that you fight stalin and people say well i guess stalin's the good guy and how evil do you have to be for someone to think that <laughs> right i mean that was not an easy call in 1941 <laughs> and then nope hitler's just doubling down every time he's like oh i gotta be the most evil guy at the table oh no i, I can't just leave this and it's just amazing and you're just baffled that a that a society because our belief in progress is just violated by the existence of nazi germany even in a way that it's not violated by the existence of stalin that i mean how, how that, that you, level how of brutality you... happens is just unfathomable to someone who didn't grow up in the middle ages for whom it happened literally every tuesday <laughs> I mean, to what degree do you think it's that you have this central, compelling villain that seem to that seems to transcend humanity? He seems closer to Thanos than he does to a human being. Right? And and uh, and the worst part is when you read about the guy, he's, I mean, he's an even thinner, less motivated character than Thanos. <laughs> he's <laughs> just a little failure of an art student. Uh, and he had one good moment of, or a few good moments in world war one. And then somehow this guy gets to run the greatest industrial power on earth. Uh, that's insane. That's nonsense. And his, and his buddy, his sidekick is a, is a chicken farmer who picks these people. It's non it, it's nonsense. And, and yeah, I mean, the, the part of it, I think is that he caused such an apocalypse. He must've been a demon figure. And so we paint him and I've certainly done it plenty of times in, in, um, uh, in, in games, uh, both at the table and in print. Uh, and you say there has to be something extra normal about this. It can't just be uh, a, 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 a failure on the politics as usual table. This has to be a, a, a gigantic, earth-shattering, religious ritual event. Um, and, of course, that leads to sloppy thinking like everything does. But it's, I think it's the only way that humans can comprehend uh, something on that scale. I mean, do you think Hitler is completely divorced from what he actually was in the sort of collective imagination now, in the same in the same way as Vlad the Impaler, Jack the Ripper? Has he become a folkloric character? Oh, he's absolutely a folkloric character, in the same way that also George Washington or Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela have become folkloric characters. I mean, we've got our, our uh, terrestrial saints the same way we have our terrestrial demons, and thank God. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he's he is, and that's one of the interesting things about how you know, we operate as, as, as human societies. And it's why I'm endlessly fascinated by, by sort of magical thinking in all of its aspects is because this is something that doesn't go away. You don't, you know, stop thinking that way just because you figured out how gravity works. Uh, you just change it around and then deny loudly that that's what you're doing. And that sort of idiotic human cussedness 
is endlessly fascinating at, at the very least in a car crash way and is uh and and it produces an awful lot of of very exciting um uh, of fiction and, and near fiction and meta fiction so just as a connoisseur of that it's good stuff i mean i don't think it's the way that you organize a species if you're in charge but you know that's what free will gets you so I want to move on now to, and I want to talk about you as a professional. Okay. And so, you, you know, you've mentioned you're starting to work for Steve Jackson. You're starting to work for Chaosium. And your wife says, you know, I prefer you happy as opposed mm-hmm. to miserable. Yeah. What was the first thing you did that you thought, wow, now I'm really an accomplished game writer, an accomplished game designer? Or, or were you just brilliant from the off? I mean, you you do have to understand that I am a absolute uh, alloy of arrogance and talent, and it's very very difficult to tell what, as you say, is my brilliance and what is just my immense self regard. I was super happy with the first book I did. I thought GURPS Alternate Earths hung the moon. I've done better work since, but I go back and I look at some of that early stuff, and. I have friends and, and beloved colleagues who are like, oh, I can't look at my early stuff. It's so terrible. It's like, well, I don't know. My early stuff is amazing. I don't know about your early stuff. Uh, but, uh, but, but I mean, I've done better things than that since. And I think, you know, once you sort of start doing it full time, then that's a moment where you're like, well, I guess this is for real. I can't take it back and go back to the insurance company now. Um, and then I, I guess that sort of that, that first triumph moment is, when I did the Star Trek role-playing game with Last Unicorn, the one that was the original series. And that one was almost all, I touched every part of making that game. I did art design. I color corrected the photographs from 1967 that we had. I figured out the fonts. I talked to the layout guy. I wrote huge chunks of it. I did the outline. I then edited everybody who turned in stuff late. I, at the last minute, asked Robin Laws to write uh, and, um, uh, vignettes, which were the best thing in the book. And I was very proud of that uh, decision to improve my book at no cost to myself. Um, I did a lot I and was one of the core designers of the system. And when that book came out and was 90%, 92% the book that I had in my head when I was writing it and looked like it fell off of Robert Justman's desk in 1968, I was very happy. And that, I think if you're, I, if I get your question right, I think maybe that's the moment where I said, yeah, not only am I good, not only can I support myself, not only am I better than average, but yeah, I can do best of breed pinnacle work if I, if I do it. And, and I think that was the first of many projects that I, I sort of like looked and, and it was not just like, yeah, that was good work. It's like, man, I wish I knew who did that. That was a good game. Oh, that was me. Um, and, and so that differential between seeing that sort of, um, uh, expression of my vision and that sort of, ah, that was a good, that was a good turn of phrase, Ken. Well done. Um, I, I think that was the moment that, uh, that Star Trek role-playing game, original series, uh, uh, book. And, and when you look at your Wikipedia page, it says, you know, Kenneth Hyde is an RPG writer who's most well known for Knight's Black Agents. Why do you think the people who wrote that page chose that particular one to highlight you i have no idea um I, I i don't know what i'm most well known for uh i think probably in in terms of sheer numbers i'm most well known for a, a little tiny thing i did called Keylong, which was actually you could play it with D. <laughs> and so probably more people have looked at that uh just mathematically than the knights black agents but i think knights black agents it had a big high profile it won two silver ennies and then the Dracula dossier, which we released for that, won like all the Ennies that it possibly could, uh, golds in in that year, 2016, I guess it was. And um, and I think maybe that's what sort of set that up on the radar, and people noticed uh, that this this mega campaign for this one game uh, had come along and knocked it out of the park. And maybe that's why. I mean, Nice Black Agents. Don't get me wrong; is another one of those games that I look at, and it's 99% the game in my head. It's one of the closest things to what I was thinking about when I wrote it as to how it turned out on the table. And and in that case, I can't even take credit. Chris Huth did such a great job with the book design and everyone else at Pell Grain, you know, uh, they, they sourced such great art and they, and they did such a wonderful job taking my, my, my text. And again, I mean, the font I wanted, Robin had already bogarted for Ash and Stars. So I was like, well, if I can't have Euro style, I'm not going to pick a font. And, uh, and uh, someone uh, suggested Gil Sands and, 
uh, for the for the boxes and, and a similar font for the text, and it looked great. So what do I know? Nothing. Um, but yeah, Nice Black Agent sort of, I think, uh, and it's another game that I, I, I think a lot of people are still playing. It's got a little more legs than a lot of role-playing games do. People, I, I still see, and admittedly, I'm looking for people on the internet who are who are playing it, but it, uh, we've got a, a Facebook group for the Dracula dossier, and people are every day saying, can I join this Facebook group? And only a very small percentage of them are scammers trying to sell, you know, cigarettes or whatever. And so what would you say then is the differences and the challenges to writing gaming material as opposed to writing conventional fiction, stories, novels? Oh, it's, it's, um, it's in, in some ways it's harder because you have to write a technical manual that doesn't bore people to sleep. Uh, it, but it still has to be clear and make all the same decisions that a technical manual does, but it also has to evoke an imaginary world the way that fiction does. The great advantage of that is you don't have to make a character that seems real because that's the player's job, right? I mean, maybe you have to with your non-player characters, or if you're writing an adventure, you have to have the, the other characters uh, come alive a little bit, but that's not part of core work of making a role-playing game design um, most times. Uh, and then so that, that lets you off a very big hook uh, but I, I think that in a lot of ways you have to do two things well instead of one thing well, and then that that makes it difficult. But, but that technical manual quality has to always be present in your mind, or else you will have produced something that is beautiful and evocative, and no one can play. And so, also, you, if you if you read your bio, it says that you were dramaturg on a production of Shadow Over Innsmouth. Yeah. How did you get involved with the theatre? Uh, this is just a weird coincidence. I mean, part of it is living in the greatest theater city in America, uh, Chicago, and there's a group, a, 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 a theater company in Chicago called Wild Claw Theater, and they are devoted to horror theater. Uh, horror is not usually present on the stage, and often people will put on horror plays and then unhorror them. So you'll see staid versions of Dracula or boring versions of Macbeth or whatever. But Wild Claw is not about that. They're all about the horror. And they were doing a play based on um, uh, Dreams in the Witch House. And they knew that Weird Tales used to be located in Chicago. At that time, Weird Tales was uh, a, a thing. And I was writing the Lovecraft column for them. And they wrote to Weird Tales and said, hey, you were based in Chicago. Can you send us uh, issues of Weird Tales to give away at the premiere? And if any of you... Uh, want to come to Chicago, we'd love to have you give a talk about Weird Tales. And the Weird Tales guys were like, we're not flying to Chicago for your stupid theater, but our Lovecraft guy lives in Chicago. Get in touch with him. And so they got in touch with me and we, you know, fell in mutual love. And I went out and I did a little talk about the the, the story and H.P. Lovecraft and Weird Tales in Chicago and uh, shook hands all around. And then I started hanging out with the theater people because they're delightful. And very shortly after, they asked me to become what they call an artistic associate of the company, which I think just means that when they need to find out if, you know, E.F. Benson is out of public domain, they ask me. I don't have to do an awful lot for them. Um, but uh, but then uh, they were mounting Shadow of Rinsmith, and my friend Scott Barsati had written it. And they said, would you like to be the dramaturg on the play and keep us all on the Lovecraftian straight and narrow? And I jumped at the chance uh, and discovered that, yes, there is a, a satisfying artistic endeavor that pays worse than role-playing game design. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, after the after that whole production was, was mounted and done and, and we'd all poured blood and heart and soul into it, and I got my check. Um, I think they gave me two checks, like half and then the other half. And I got my check and I said to Sheila, if I can just do this 180 more times, I'm quitting this role-playing game gig. <laughs> I, I know I've, I've done a lot of it myself and I know exactly how you feel. But how, how successful do you think the production was? I mean, so much of Shadow Over Innsmouth is a chase through the town and into the country. I mean... But the, that's one of that's one of the things that that, that uh, Wildclaw specializes in is being able to put things on stage you didn't think you could put on stage. So, yeah, they managed the chase with some very clever staging. Part of it is Scott. Part of it is our director, Shane. Um, you can't describe it, right? You can't say, oh, they did really clever stuff with the set. That's what they did. But unless you're in the theater, and again, that's why live theater is better than some ludicrous person talking about live theater on a podcast. Um uh, you, you can't really see how they did it, but they, they manage it. And because Scott wrote a really terrific play that maintains tension, 
uh, in those moments, it maintained tension in those moments. It was, it was just a terrific play. It was very successful. It sold out, uh, many, many nights and it ran for its whole run and everyone enjoyed it and it got good write-ups in the, in the reader and in other places in the city. Um, and there, there is, you know, unless you're, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, no one's play is a success on the level that anyone in the universe hears about it. But, you know, for a Chicago theater production and certainly for off loop, it, it did amazingly well. It was a really good, really good production. And I mean, how were the Deep One costumes? Uh, they were kept wisely minimal. Um, the, the humans with the Innsmouth look, a lot of that was carried out through dialect and through acting. Some of it was makeup, of course. Uh, Wild Claw has, does great makeup, and a lot of it was lighting. Uh, sound design was su- super important. They have great sound people. And then we do have a, a, a big monster at the end, which, again, because you have gotten into the play and you were living in that fictional world, if you saw a photograph of that, you'd say, well, that's the dumbest monster I've ever seen in my life. But on stage, of course, it works. And um, and, it, and it worked really well and was terrific. So you also do a podcast, which I discovered when I was sort of trawling for an RPG podcast that wasn't an actual play one, which is, yeah. which is really bloody hard to find, I find. Um, why did you start... Kids love the actual play. Yeah. Uh, why did you start it and, and what function do you think it serves? I did not start it. I want that clear. Robin Laws, my uh, beloved Canadian colleague, confrere, and co-podcaster, started it. And he started it out of, uh, I don't I don't say un-Robin-like, but I will say un-Canadian arrogance. He looked at the field of podcasting as it existed seven years ago, and he said, man, we could win so many free ennies just by being better than these guys. We should start a podcast. And also a part of it was just he and I love hanging. Uh, We love hanging and talking. And I think part of him was like, I think people would like to hear Ken and I hang and talk. And that was the, the, so it was arrogance and kindliness, which, you know, again, that's Robin. Um, uh, And arrogance in a good way. I mean, not a bad way Uh, because you're Robin. And so you can back it up. But he, he said, let's do this podcast. We can easily rise to the, to the top of the market. And then you and I will get to talk every week. And of course, I have not gotten where I am by ignoring Robin's good ideas. Uh, and so I said, yeah, Robin, whatever. That sounds fun. Figuring we'd probably do it for a couple of years. We'd both get bored. We'd, we'd go into other things. And here we are still doing it because it is still fun. Talking to Robin is one of the great joys of my life. And I think it would be one of the great joys of anyone's life who was a serious game designer and who thought about narrative because Robin is, you know, he's Robin. He's amazing. He's super, super bright and 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 uh, and fun and clever and, and creative and, and wild. And he goes in a way that you wouldn't think. So it's never rote or boring, even when we're talking about something that we've talked about a million times before, like bad behavior at the table or, or uh, uh, dysfunctional GMing or whatever. We've always got a, a spin or Robin has a spin that I can then riff on and follow on with. Um, but yeah, I, what it what it does in the field is I don't know if it does anything specific in the field except give more people than can come to game conventions a chance to hear Robin and I, you know, offer you know, uh, 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 advice and then sort of offer other tidbits of stuff that would be fun at the table, whether it's some crazy uh, occultist from the 1800s or whether it's some wild historical backflap or just, uh, hey, you're, you're roasting your vegetables wrong. You know, whatever. Anything that makes your life better, that's what we're for. And so it seems to me as well that you're a big fan of the neologism. And one of the things that really stands out when you listen to Ken and Robin talk about stuff for any amount of time is this word will crop up. And this word is elliptony. And yeah. you've explained it. I mean, in the sort of year that I've been listening to the show, you've explained it a few times, but probably people who are listening to this show won't be familiar with it. So firstly, what is elliptony? And is there a part of you that hopes that it'll come into common usage? Because it seems to be a word of incredible utility. Yeah. I mean, I I came up with it because there was no word that meant all the crazy stuff, right? Um, That meant magic and pseudoscience and the Loch Ness Monster and astrology and Reiki and, uh, uh, you know, Flat Earth and uh, Kennedy conspiracy theories and all the things that, while they are entertaining, are not actually true. Uh, and so magic is not a big enough word. Occultism is not a big enough word. Folklore is not a big enough word. Cryptozoology, much too narrow a word. Uh, conspiracy thinking gets part of it. Magical thinking gets part of it. But that's two words. 
and I just thought, let's let's have one word. And roughly at the time I was deciding we needed that word, um, uh, the lovely and talented Boris Zhirinovsky, uh, at the time insane um, uh, Russian uh, communist, uh, now an insane Russian nationalist, but still just the same Boris, uh, the same Vladimir, um, threatened uh, the United States and uh, the Croatians and everyone who would listen with Russia's elliptic weapon. And I was like, that's it. He's got a nonsense weapon and we don't know what it is. It could be a science nonsense weapon or a magic nonsense weapon or a, a alternative vitamin nonsense weapon, but we know it's a nonsense weapon. So uh, for a while I thought, how about elliptonics? Is it the field of elliptonics? And then I thought, no, that's too sciencey. It needs to go one bigger. And it's, so it's elliptony. And I thought, there we go. Now I have a word. Now there's a word that means all of that. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see it catch on because as you say, it does fill a need. It is super nice. And, you know, Shakespeare made, what, 700 words, uh, 1500 words, whatever it is. I, I wouldn't mind making one. I'd say I'm one fifteen hundredth as good as Shakespeare. Sure. And it, it sounds right. It, so, it doesn't sound like a word someone came up with, right? It sounds like right. a proper word that would be in a dictionary. Although I would someone so, did yeah. come up with them at some point, you assume. Yeah, right. I mean, Shakespeare, probably. But yeah, um, absolutely. The, the, it, it, there's, a, there's a clear need. I have filled that clear need. In a properly ordina- organized society, I would be, I would be giving lectures at the, at the Penn um, uh, Awards on my new word. But there you go. Prophet is not honored in his own country. That's how it works. So your next game then is one that I've never played, but I've heard of because it seemed to have caused an incredible amount of ripples when it came out and is is, is held up as sort of the artistic acme of role-playing games. And this is Dogs in the Vineyard. Why is this game held in such high regard? Because it's amazing. Um, I met Vincent Baker uh, during that first bloom of the golden age of role-playing in circa 2002. And he had a little game called Kill Puppies for Satan. And I met him and he gave me a copy because I had a, a column at the time that I wrote game reviews in called Out of the Box. And he gave me Kill Puppies for Satan and I looked at it and it's like, this is not a dumb game. This is really clever. And this is a game about bigger things than just, you know, edge lording. This is a game about uh, guilt. Uh, and it's a game about, you know, uh, kind of taking ownership of your actions. It, this is a big, real game. And, and so I, I praised it in the review and I, I told Vincent what I thought. And uh, Vincent was, you know, oh, shucks, gosh. And then uh, and he's still like that. I mean, he's freaking Beethoven of game design and he's still super like, oh, you know, whatever, guys. Um, but, uh, but, but then he came out with Dogs in the Vineyard and he gives that to me. And this is, you know, uh, Kill Puppies for Satan. I was like, this is, this this kid shows promise. And then Dogs of the Vineyard is like the freaking Ninth Symphony. It's amazing. And it, it takes the great American ritual uh, art form, the Western, and it successfully translates it and what it's about to the game table. It's a game about responsibility and morality, which is the core of the Western. And it has these beautiful mechanics that encourage you to uh, both head walk into trouble and to resolve it uh it beautifully it's just a masterpiece of, of game design it's, it's an amazing piece of work and it's still maybe the second or third greatest role-playing game ever designed and i held like one of the very first copies in my hand i'm, I'm buddies with uh his, his brother uh drew who drew the cover uh that i was i was sort of i wasn't president of the creation i wasn't in vincent's game group um how great would that have been but i was I was one of the very first people to, to I, I heard the premiere of the Eroica, right? I heard that, that, that those first bars as early as anybody did practically. And it was just, it was just a, a game changer. It was amazing. It was one of those games that, like I said, before that you said, well, we pretty much have role-playing games to a science. We can, like you said at the beginning, it's, it, it's just all GURPS one way or the other. You're just using some rules or not. And then uh, dogs, in the vineyard comes out and is like, we can ask entirely different questions and we can answer them like a real art form in play driven by the mechanics. And you look at that and it's just a, it's a tour de force. It's just an amazing accomplishment. I'm, I'm still in awe of it. And, and, and what would, what would be an example of something it does mechanically that, you know, does that makes that? I mean, thing? there's uh, the, 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 I mean, the escalation mechanics, for example, if you begin with uh, words and fists, you roll uh, little dice. I think it's die fours. And then 
you can escalate to a knives or, or chair legs. And then that goes up a die size, maybe die eights or something. And then, but now you can't take it back. Now there's more damage. And then you can pull out the gun and that's die 12. So that's like the biggest thing. It's, it's enormous. And now you really can't take it back. Now you are going to kill somebody. And you've made that decision the entire time. You have literally walked across these lines because you think it's important. And that focuses, that focuses play. The, 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 the notion that pulling out the gun is a significant event and that it is an event that requires ritual demarcation. That, that didn't happen in games before. It was just like, well, what do you do? A die 10 plus one? Okay, roll. And it was just the same thing, right? It was like I was using a halberd, but in 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 a Western game, you don't you're not just using a halberd. That's a real moment uh, when you're saying, "Yeah, I think this is important enough to risk shooting a man to death," and that's a big story. And and for Vincent to capture that, and it happens at every table. It's not a thing. It's just me. It's not just me who was brought up on uh, on westerns and cowboy movies. This happens at every table that that it's played at. People recognize the seriousness of that game, and because it's also about the moral concerns of, of, of who decides what's right. Oh, it's you. Now, what are you deciding? I mean, that's a, that's a big place to play. Uh, it's a, it's a powerful thing that, you know, um, it, it's a game where you're all paladins and that's the point. Um, so you, the paladin isn't the game wrecker. The paladin paladining is the game. And that's a, that's a big ask. And it's a, and it answers it magnificently. And to what degree is this game a love letter or condemnation of Mormonism or is it, or is it subtler than that? I think it comes out of Mormonism. I mean, obviously, um, I, I I believe, and Vincent and I have barely ever talked about it because it's not the most important thing to either of us. Um, uh, Vincent, I, I believe, came out of a Mormon background um, and informed that game with that sort of um, messianic, um, you know, our, we're doing the Lord's work on earth type attitude. But again, that was the attitude of literally everyone in the 19th century. Right. I mean, that you believed, you know, you, we just fought a civil war over, you know, questions of ultimate morality. That's what the West was full of, was people who were a thousand percent sure that God told them what to do and was on their side. Um, and so that moral seriousness that the Mormons have maintained from the 19th century, uh, I think, informed that game in a way. But I don't think it's a condemnation of Mormonism because it's not. It's not about Mormonism. First of all, Vincent is very uh, careful to say, this is not Mormonism. You are not in Utah. This is a ritual, different world. Um, but uh, but the structure of having people whose job it is to decide what is right and what is wrong, every society has that. The Mormons just don't lie to themselves about it. Um, and I think to some extent that honesty is also part of the Western. But I think that, um, while the way that Vincent made that game is inextricable from Vincent because it's a work of art, I think that if Vincent had been brought up a Presbyterian, I think he would have made a Western that was almost identical to that because it's about a bigger question than what Joseph Smith did or didn't see in 1829. And so he, he said, Vincent Baker has said, that he is not going to republish the game because he sees that the setting is problematic. Now, you might not have spoken to him about this, and I assume that you haven't, but what could he mean by that? What, what do you think well, he sees I, as problematic? I don't have the faintest idea of what he... I mean, and the good thing is that we have the entire rest of Twitter to point out what's problematic about shit. <laughs> I'm just here to point out that it's a great game, and that's what I do. Um, I am not in the business of going around and policing everybody else's game, regardless of who they are, and certainly not if they're Vincent Baker. Um, it, it, you know... I, I can't imagine going up to Beethoven and telling him, oh, I think that the chorus in Ode to Joy is problematic. Sorry, it's Beethoven. Back off. No, that's the job of the um, Brexit party. But... Right, exactly. It's, it's the job of literally every person on the in the world whose life is perfect, and so they have to go fix everybody else. Um, fine, but it's not me, and it's not my job. And I, you know, there are few enough people who recognize a game as genius that I think that I'm doing my job when I say, Dogs in the Vineyard is a freaking genius game. And if Vincent ever gets to a position where he thinks that he can publish that game or a version of that game again, I will immediately go and I will look at it and I will play it. And I suspect, because it's Vincent, I will praise it and love it 
And I suspect also that because it's Dogs in the Vineyard, nothing important about the game will have changed. So I want to move on now to a person that you're sort of inextricably linked with. So much so that you you said that you've got an entire shelf in the room that I'm looking at now. Two shelves, actually. Yeah, dedicated <laughs> to him. I guess technically bookcases, not bookshelves. But yeah, anyway. Uh, and this is this is H.P. Lovecraft. So I think we might share something here in that I was introduced to Lovecraft through Call of Cthulhu, the role-playing mm. game. Was this the same with you? No. Um, I was introduced to Lovecraft by uh, the anthologist uh, Graf Conklin, who put uh, Color Out of Space in, um, I believe it was called Adventures in Time and Space, something like that. Um, he had a big science fiction-y omnibus. And almost all of them, because they were classic science fiction, Golden Age science fiction, and Silver Age science fiction, were stories about jut-jawed Earthmen of all races, creeds, and colors uh, fighting off aliens. And they were great. And it was like, we're going to build a rocket, and we're going to build an atom bomb, and we're going to build an atom bomb rocket. And it's like, yes, this is what I want. I'm an 11-year-old boy. I cannot get enough of this. And Colorado Space was right in the middle of that, and it scared me out of a week's growth. I was in the literally least scary place in the universe. I was on my couch in the living room in Oklahoma City in 1977, 76, whatever it was. Nothing has been less scary, I want to emphasize. And I read Color Out of Space, and I was terrified. The hair standing up on, on, my, on, my, on my arms. I had no method to process it. Um, I'd read scary things before, but nothing that good. And for about three years, I was just like, that was, that I was hit by lightning, basically. And that was how I figured it out. And then my father had uh, a, a copy of the Dunwich Horror and others uh, in the garage packed with his old books um, from, I guess, when he was in the, in the service. And he still had a lot of his books just packed away. He didn't have them on the shelves uh, in for good reason, if they were Lovecraft books. And I, um, uh, I was going through them and I dug it out and it's like, I recognize that HP Lovecraft name. That's the guy that is the most terrifying and, 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 and amazing writer in the history of mankind. And so I sort of rationed reading those books. Cause as far as I knew, that was the only Lovecraft that there was in the world. My library system didn't have anything by him. So I, I read that collection and finished it with the shadow over Innsmouth at summer camp. And I was at summer camp in, I don't want to say North, North Carolina or somewhere. And you couldn't, you, you were canoeing and making lanyards and doing all kinds of things during the day. So your only reading time was technically after lights out. And so the only place in the camp that there was always a light because it was the state law was at the end of the dock. <laughs> so genius, genius level Ken height has his Lovecraft book goes out to the end of the dock, sits down literally with my feet dangling over the end of the dock, frogs and snakes and snapping turtles and Lord knows what are all out there making their nature noises. I'm under a sodium lamp. So I'm literally the opposite. I'm now in the scariest place in the world. Uh, certainly to a, to a, to a young lad who is, um, uh, still in the United States of America. Um, and I'm reading the shadow over Innsmouth of all things. And, Guess what? That also terrified me. <laughs> and so I think from that first couch moment to that dock moment, Lovecraft just settled into my DNA in a way. It just folded into the folds of my brain um, so that I, I could not get away from him if I wanted to at this point. And I don't want to because uh, the fiction, even when you read it under normal people circumstances, uh, the, the great stuff is great. It's magnificent. He's like an all time hitter. He's like the you know, I don't know, the Ted Williams of, of writing. I mean, I've, I've, with Lovecraft, that sort of great period from sort of, uh, I don't know enough about it, but sort of rats in the wall onwards. Yeah. I find the stuff previous to that really hard work. Do you think he's a consistent writer or are there stuff, for, for people who don't want to become Lovecraft scholars, is there stuff you can just happily leave behind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like, every, I mean, for God's sake, if no one ever read or performed *Time and of Athens*, we would be richer as a culture. Shakespeare has has missable garbage. Of course, Lovecraft has bad writing. All writers have bad writing. Some writers are clever enough never to publish their bad writing, or don't have uh, fanboy cults that publish all of their bad writing and then insist it stay in print forever. Um, <laughs> I mean, God knows. Uh, you know. 
you probably go back and you read the early F. Scott Fitzgerald stories. They're not great either, but uh, that's how writing is. Um, but uh, Lovecraft, you know, like you say, I, I date his great period a little bit later just because I think of Rats in the Walls and Doom that Came to Sarnath and Cats of Ulthar as sort of one-offs. And then from Call of Cthulhu on, that's when he finds his voice and his subject matter and, and they blend. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I, in uh, my book, Tour to Lovecraft, I, I list what I consider the, the great stories and there's about 17 of them. And out of the 50 odd that he wrote, 17 out of 50 is a great batting average. Like I say, we're talking Ted Williams. We're talking Ty Cobb. We're talking all timers, Frank Thomas. And and what is it about? Because for me, when I read Lovecraft, I, I sort of love that, that notion that we are completely insignificant in the scope of the universe. And all of these things are happening around us. And we try to extract meaning, but fundamentally there is none. What is it about Lovecraft's ethos that appeals to you? I mean, I mean, that's a big part of it, that, that notion of cosmicism. I mean, like I say, I'm a Presbyterian and Calvinism and cosmicism are very, very close uh, in that we both believe that the world is a bleak nightmare. It's just that Calvinism believes there's a shard of hope somewhere. And Lovecraft is like, ah, you're fooling yourself. And, you know, in the dark night of your soul, of course you think that. Everyone thinks that. It's a universal fear. And that's part of what makes Lovecraft universal is that approach to that universal fear. Um, And he just, he was, you know, he's got the settler effect. He's the first person to... uh, make the Gothic, which is one of the oldest and most powerful storytelling traditions, a modern literature again. So you've got that going for you. Uh, he was a poet, not a great poet, but anyone who spends decade after decade thinking of what is the exact right word for this is just going to produce a lot of really great sentences. Um, he's a he's a terrific writer. And, and the, the thing that appeals to me, I think, is all of those things. Plus, as you say, Call of Cthulhu, which came along right in the middle of my Lovecraft Jones and was the greatest role-playing game ever. And that combination of being the first person to create a maltheistic uh, false uh, cosmology, a a maltheistic false mythology, there had been like one false mythology before him, uh, Dunzany, and Dunzany is more about writing a poetic world than a philosophically uh, cogent one. Lovecraft is very much... Uh, he has the sense of play of a great hoaxer. He has the sense of terror of a great Puritan, <clears throat> and he has the and he has the gothic sensibility that you need as, as a horrorist, and and just just churns out, you know, masterpiece out of masterpiece after masterpiece. Even if you don't, you know, go on to as you say, become inextricably linked to him the way that I have, it, it you know, it, I have. Um, uh, I, I dare anyone who cares about the field to read Lovecraft and, and come away uh, unmoved by it, unaffected by it. I mean, I, I think the first time I fell in love with Lovecraft was when I was reading Shadow Out of Time. And he just sort of offhandedly mentions that he's kind of sat next to one of the cockroach people that will assume control of the earth after the humans are long dead. And it just blew my mind. And I thought, oh, the scope of this is astonishing. And, and and the way that human beings are not at the center of the story, or the center of the mythos, yeah. at least, was right, yeah. so exciting to me. Yeah, it, it, and it is. It's, it's, a, it's a mythology for the 20th century uh, when uh, science had demonstrated that no... But we were not the center of uh, creation, that we were one little species out of a billion. Uh, we were not the center of the universe. We were one little star out of a billion. Uh, we were not the center of history. We were one blip uh, in time out of a billion. And all of those things were being discovered at the same time. They were undermining huge swaths of, of culture. Lovecraft is the person who comes up with the response to it, which admittedly is abject, shivering terror. But that's not a bad response. It's at least a start. I mean, you're at least ex- accepting the magnitude of the problem. And, and so, I mean, you can't really have a discussion about Lovecraft without discussing him as the man and the views mm. that he had. So where, how do we square the circle on that he held some pretty unsavory views? And, and where do you stand? People often ask me this, you know, where do you stand on the creator versus the work question? Can we like the work of someone who's an abominable, abominable human being. Of course we can. We do it all the time. 
I mean, you know, for God's sake, uh, you know, anyone who's a fan of, 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 uh, of a rock star likes the work of someone who's an abominable human being, uh, by definition, almost, um, that's a, that should be a dead question. Um, uh, Caravaggio straight up murdered a guy. It's not like you take his art and throw it out. You know, William Shakespeare's life probably does not withstand close examination either. Uh, and certainly he held, uh, beliefs that we now find abhorrent, uh, certainly Lovecraft, held them a lot longer than most people, even most people in the 1920s. Uh, but you can't just sort of arbitrarily decide I'm only consuming art uh, made by Oberlin graduates starting in 2010. Or I guess you can decide that, but you've impoverished yourself for no reason. It seems reason. that a lot of people do. Well, you know, I, and again, there are a lot of people who do a lot of things that impoverish themselves. I'm not harmed by it. They can knock themselves out. But, uh, but no, you have to separate art from the artist because artists are human beings. And as Lovecraft and John Calvin and literal every experience you have in your life should tell you, human beings are terrible. They're just awful. Um, the fact that they can produce art is one of the only values that they have. Why would you then take that value and take it out? And I mean, to what degree does his views translate into his work? Does it come through in his work? Is Call of Cthulhu... Is, is Shadow, Shadow Over Innsmouth is often criticised as sort of thinly veiled eugenics. It's, it's sort yeah, of right, a yeah. eugenic argument. I mean, do you see that as valid, as relevant? Well, I mean, I don't think that you can know anything about Lovecraft and not see the eugenic concerns and the concerns about miscegenation and the concerns about degeneration, which was a very strongly racialized belief in his day present in that work. One of the things about Innsmouth though, is the way that Lovecraft recognizes this tendency in himself. And I don't want to say subverts it, but he at least writes around it. So the hideous foreign element is right. The world is the way they see it, not the way that white new England sees it. The foreigners, the, the Kanakis, the despised South Pacific Islanders, they got rid of these things. We invited them in. Now, again, there is still huge amounts of, of, of very questionable politics and, uh, and culture to unpack, even in a statement like that. But it's not immediately the same degree as, oh, they're foreigners, therefore they're evil, which, of course, Lovecraft also does a, a great deal of in, say, uh, Horror at Red Hook. But the degree to which by Innsmouth he is beginning to deepen and unpack and work changes on and write. Um, he's a great fugist, right? He does the theme and then he does the versions of the theme and the counterpoint, even there, the theme uh, makes Innsmouth a bigger story than that. And uh, because Lovecraft is literature, or at least because Innsmouth is literature, when we get to the ending now, it is a completely legitimate reading. Uh, and a lot of people read it that way to say, Oh, thank God. Uh, the narrator, Robert Olmsted, has finally, he's finally come home. He's accepted who he is. And that's why when uh, Dan Gildark made a movie out of it, he made it about a, a gay man coming out and coming to terms with his own sexuality, which is the last thing in the world Lovecraft would have thought this story was about. But the movie that Gildark made works and the story works on that level. And that's because literature, um, you can do an anti-war version of Henry V, even though, again, Shakespeare would have killed you for suggesting that. Um, it's a jingoistic play, but I have seen, and many people have performed absolutely great versions of that play that go against what Shakespeare thought. Uh, you can do the same thing with Lovecraft. Um, and I think that the deeper you go into the mythos and the later he writes, and it's not because he becomes less racist. He's still a horrible human being on that level alone. Although again, in his individual relationships, he's still like, I don't know, mentoring young Jewish authors for free for two years while he's dying of cancer and starving to death. So put that in the balance pan, somebody, but the, um, uh, but his, his beliefs about Hitler are still, well, well, he's, he's a, he's a goof, but by God, I like him. Um, he, so at no point is he like, Oh man, I was wrong. But at the end of the, the last story, he writes, uh, Haunter in the dark. The only people who are remotely effective at stopping the evil are foreign Catholics. The people that he at, began believing were symptomatic of the evil. And so that's something that, and that happens entirely in the fiction. It barely happens in his personality or his personal beliefs, but it absolutely happens in the fiction. The fiction becomes more nuanced and deeper because he's a great writer and great writers can't turn out one note garbage. That's if they could do that, then they would not be great writers. So your next game then is GURPS fourth edition. Now, 
GURB stands for Generic Universal Role-Playing System. To what degree is this true? Um, I think that most people agree. I think the, the consensus is that factory GURPS, the GURPS that you get, stock car GURPS, performs amazingly well right up to, say, the middle of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You start having Superman and Captain Marvel, GURPS just probably... It, 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 it keeps fighting by God, but you're fighting it too. But if you get, you know, up to Captain America and Iron Man, you can still play GURPS all the way down to bunnies and burrows. And that's pretty universal. And I think most people agree with that. And I think a lot of people say it doesn't handle such and such genre. And that's because they are mistaking the entire wall of tools for the tools you need at the table. So GURPS is a 32... Uh, uh, socket wrench set. You only need one wrench uh, uh, head at any given time. GURPS is the same way. Huge amounts of possibility. Your job, and a job that the game admittedly does very little to help you do, is to take the four tools you need off that wall and use them at the table. And so once you've sort of come to that epiphany, and again, I want to emphasize the game does very little to help you come to it, um, Suddenly, yes, it, it becomes much more universal and much more generic and, and allows uh, much more uh, flexibility at the table than I think its, uh, its reputation is. And its reputation, of course, is because people get uh, the, the people at the very far end of the bell curve who love the notion of doing a cube root to figure out how a, Thunderbird, uh, a Ford Thunderbird works took over the message boards, both at Steve Jackson and online, and their happy enthusiasm has drowned out the sort of, uh, you, you can play rabbits. Anyone, you, you can play rabbits. <laughs> and, and, you know, and God bless people who like cube roots, but I don't think it's the majority of human beings, much less the majority of tabletop gamers. And uh, GURPS does a lot more than cube roots, but you, you get the, the slide rule crowd excited and they're going to stay excited. So where do you stand as a player, as a GM, as a, as a general gamer, on the whole notion of sort of streamlined versus granular, because it seemed to me that D and D, for instance, in its fifth edition, really aimed for streamlined rules light gaming. Are you yeah. someone who adores hit zones and armor penetration and all of that sort of stuff, or do you like just one roll and done? I mean, I'm a, a my instincts are towards elegance and simplicity. I think, but I like to have enough edge cases and enough uh, rules meet that you're not abstracting away the reason you're playing that genre. So when I wrote Knights Black Agents, I borrowed Robin's uh, combat maneuvers and I added uh, cherries and I did other things to make it feel more like a Bourne movie and less like just any old game at the table. And I think that's that's the trade-off you make as a game designer. And uh, I'm taking GURPS to the cabin, not because it's the greatest role-playing game ever, but because if it's the only role-playing game at the cabin, we're not going to want to just play Call of Cthulhu. We're going to want to do everything. And GURPS does most everything, and it does it pretty well. Um, and, and I like that about GURPS. And a lot of my very early design experience was in GURPS, and I will still go back to GURPS and say, maybe I'm not going to do it this way, but I know that someone, and someone actually pretty bright, has figured out how I model this ridiculous thing that happens with GURPS. And I can say, here's how they model it. Maybe I don't model it the same way at all, but at least I've seen how it's done once. And that's a huge advantage in design. And you specified the fourth edition. Why that one? It's just the one that, um, uh, it, it fits in fewer books, so you can bring it to the cabin easier. It's They took all the special cases and everything out of third edition, and they boiled it all down and created a unified field. Uh, in fourth, uh, Sean Punch and Dave Pulver did yeoman work uh, uh, taking a, a, a game that kind of existed across sort of three books, but actually a lot more, and, and reunifying it. And that's why the fourth edition is it's just the, the most compact, uh, or, or at least the most uh, concentrated <clears throat> uh, version of, of something that still gives you all of those tools on the wall. So I want to talk now, if you listen to your podcast for any length of time, Chicago will continue to be mentioned. And it seems to me you're a vociferously proud Chicagoan. What is it about Chicago that makes it so special? Well, I mean, first of all, it's the greatest city in the world. So just by itself, that would make it special. <laughs> but for me, 
Um, I came to Chicago to go to grad school in 1988, and I had been primed by many, many ritual viewings of the Blues Brothers and Ferris Bueller's Day Out. So I already knew I was going somewhere great. And when I got there in the first week, uh, WXRT, which at that time was an independent radio station, it's since been sold, um, was playing, it was, it was like Bruce Springsteen's birthday or something. And I was a big Springsteen fan because, again, Oklahoma, 1970s, um, 1980s. And they were playing cuts from European concert tours of songs I didn't even know he'd performed, much less recorded. And I was not an amateur Springsteen fan. I was not a absolutely, you know, maniacal one. But I got here and they're playing on Bruce Springsteen's birthday. So it's a lot of Springsteen. And a lot of it is stuff I'd never heard. And I thought, a city that can do this is amazing. And then I had Giordano's uh, uh, stuffed pizza for the first time. I was like, oh my God, they've made pizza. I thought pizza was as good as it could be. And look, look what they've done to pizza. And my dad was an architect. And I walked north over the Michigan Avenue Bridge. So you have the old Colony Building, you have the Wrigley Building, you have Mies van der Rohe's IBM Building, which, you know, when it's surrounded by other buildings, uh, Mies van der Rohe is very tolerable. You've got uh, the Carbon and Carbide Building. You are in basically one of the most beautiful physical spaces, architecturally speaking, in the hemisphere. Now they've built the Trump Tower there because nothing, we can't have nice things. But uh, before, this was pre-Trump Tower. And... It was just amazing. It was like, I, I never want to leave here. This is, uh, the, the, if you're an architect or an architect's son or into architecture in any way, it's like living in the Louvre because every master, every great art architect for the last 150 years has built a masterpiece in Chicago. And I, I've been going downtown, you know, like I say, since 1988, I still see vistas that I didn't recognize or didn't know. It's like living in one of those Hokusai books, you know, 55 views of Mount Fuji or whatever it is. I've got, 55 views of the frickin' Fisher building, much less Mount Fuji. And there's dozens of buildings like that downtown. And then once you get farther out, there's Frank Lloyd Wright. There's uh, all kinds of great architects. There's Clay's Oldenburg has built a crazy sculpture. It's just an amazing city to be in if you are a, a, an aficionado of the built arts. And then obviously, again, I've alluded already to the theater scene. It's a great music town. I, I went to a zillion billion concerts when I was young and my knees could still hold me up for three hours. Um, it's uh, an amazing food city. Uh, really, there's nothing wrong with it except the weather. And the weather, frankly, just keeps, you know, uh, the riffraff out. It's our it's our velvet rope. Uh, I, I like to say people put up with Los Angeles to live in the weather and they put up with the weather to live in Chicago. And that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about people. And so, you know, when I think of Chicago, and I think if you were to speak to anyone who knows nothing about Chicago, you know, it's all Al Capone, it's corruption, it's, you know, political intrigue. I mean, to what degree is this true? Or is this... I mean, it, it's it's absolutely true. Although I will point out that when I was in Paris for Gen Con France, and I went into a kebab shop, and I was wearing a White Sox hat, and the guy is talking to me, and he's like, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Chicago. And he says... Michael Jordan. So there is at least one, abs and again, pinnacle human achievement, NBD, but KBD, uh, that people associate with Chicago besides uh, beloved Scarface Al. Uh, but yeah, no, Chicago is, is ridiculously corrupt in the way that most North American cities and certainly most North American cities that have been run by one political party for generations are corrupt. And that is true. Uh, and it is... Even amongst American cities, it is kind of special. Uh, I think New Orleans, right now my New Orleans listeners are saying amateurs, and they're probably right. Uh, Charleston, South Carolina is probably a, 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 a rat's nest. I think Boston's pretty bad. But Chicago sort of does it bigger and more legendarily. Uh, and certainly, you know, when uh, my wife, who's from Omaha, Nebraska, moved to Chicago, she spent, I think, the first 15 years just dumbfounded at the level to which... Chicagoans sort of accept the a, a degree of backroom dealing and glad handing that would be an indictable offense in Nebraska, um, and and it, but it's just true. It it is. There's there's no getting around it. Um, we have apparently decided we're never going to elect uh, anyone from a different political party, which would be the actual way to solve it. So it's just work around it. And for a while, we did have the advantage of being ruled by monarchs, which meant that they weren't just strip mining the place. They were leaving some of it for their, for their heirs. 
Um, now, who can say what's happening? And, you know, the new mayor, uh, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, is at least not part of the uh, original machine, and the degree to which she can adapt to it or adapt it to her, it'll be interesting to see. Harold Washington couldn't do it, uh, God rest him. Um, so I'm not sanguine, but then if you never expect anything, you're only happily surprised. So on this, you did a great sort of rundown of the mayoral election in Chicago uh, a couple of months ago on your show. And you kept yeah. referring to the machine. And you right. referred to machine candidates and things like this. Mm-hmm. Can you, for a layperson, explain the Chicago machine? And this is this is not just the Chicago machine. This is true in every city that has an organization like this. And it, in America, it goes back to Tammany Hall, uh, and, and which was, in fact, founded by uh, Aaron Burr. So our first political machine comes from Aaron Burr. I salute you, founding father and murderer. Um, but a political machine basically exists uh, when a political party can reliably provide votes. And not just reliably provide votes, but reliably provide the deciding vote in every precinct. And that can be by corruption or fraud or just by uh, catering to that precinct better than any other uh, political party is likely to, that they get a a generational handle on people. And once they do that, they can trade that votes for money and power. And the machine is basically the organism that evolves to maximize those votes to create money and power for itself. And the machine, therefore, has to make sure it doesn't ever risk those precious, precious electoral margins by nominating someone who the people aren't going to vote for. And it also has to make sure it doesn't want to risk that precious, precious money and power by nominating someone who is honest. So it becomes a, a literally a machine, a thing that operates by itself without anyone touching it, um, because all of the incentives are to feed concentration of power, which feeds corruption, which feeds um, uh, being able to have power and money. And so those are the things people desire. You can optimize a political system to work that way. And to break a machine, it takes a, 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 a person who can get votes where you used to not be able to get votes. And sometimes that's a transformative political figure. Uh, and, and the machine actually then has to uh, compete and is probably, uh, and, and is weakened and, and driven away. And in other cases, it's a figure who is defeated by the machine. And uh, even if they won a few elections and it, can expand into their old audience and, and adapt and adjust. The, the example in Chicago is that uh, Mayor Harold Washington, who was not part of the machine, was a, a, an African-American, uh, ran for mayor, the first African-American mayor in Chicago history, and he ran against the machine. The machine pulled out every god-awful stop to stop him, but he was a great politician, and he was able to connect with a large enough number of black and Hispanic votes that he won the elections. And so he died in office, uh, basically from stress and overwork. Uh, and immediately the machine said, who's corrupt and Hispanic. And they recruited enough corrupt Hispanic aldermen that they could calve off that voting majority. And they certainly had corrupt, uh, African-American aldermen before, but they, you know, doubled down on that and they spread the wealth out a little bit so that they could maintain a grip on power. And so that's why Harold Washington's electoral movement basically died with him because the next person to come along and say, I'm the heir to Harold. First of all, the machine made sure there were many heirs to Harold trying to do it. And then second of all, they couldn't offer anything because some of his key allies had been co-opted because they were, as humans are everywhere, interested in wealth and power and less so in fighting uh, bad things. And to what degree was the 44th president a product of Chicago and how was that reflected in the way he ran the country? I mean, uh, Obama, again, he comes from uh, my neighborhood, Hyde Park, which is uh, a uh, is, is in Chicago. And only in Chicago do they call people who actually believe in honest th- in honesty goo-goos, which is short for good government. But you're a goo-goo liberal in Chicago if you are someone like uh, Barack Obama. And Obama had plenty of go along to get along deals with some unsavory people because he's a Chicago politician. Um, and I, this is not the time or place to get into it, but he, he, he was not a particular saint, but he 
when he grew up uh, in Chicago politics, but he was never a Chicago politician in the sense he never ran for alderman. He ran for Congress and lost because he uh, went against a machine candidate. And then he ran for Senate and would have lost if it hadn't been for um, uh, the machine saying, oh, it'd be nice to have a senator owe us favors because there's a Republican senator who hates our guts and we need to spread the wealth around. So they leaned on a Chicago judge to unseal his opponent's divorce records. And that, you know, it turned out his divorce was exciting. Uh, It was Jack Ryan who was divorced from Jerry Ryan, seven of nine. And uh, that made riveting reading. And everyone was like, well, I don't know if I can vote for a guy who did all that stuff. And uh, so he re- he withdrew from the candidacy. The Republicans put up a, a chump and uh, Obama walked to victory as a senator. So in a way, he was beholden to the machine for doing that. But he was not a product of the machine because he was a goo And the machine would never trust a goo with power because God knows what they'd do with it. They'd fritter it away. And uh, again, this is not the time or place really to go into it. But when he got to Chicago... I think he uh, got to Washington, rather. I think he still had that goo-goo in him. And so he was like, well, I think if we just, you know, uh, talked about it, we could all agree. And it's like, no one who'd ever been governor of anything would think that. I mean, uh, you know, uh, love him or hate him, George Bush had been governor of Texas for two terms or whatever it was. He knew how to make political deals across party lines. President Obama just thought literally if you lectured at someone that they would agree with you because he was a college professor. That's not true. That's not even true in college, for God's sake. And it's certainly not true in Washington, D.C., when they can say, nah, I don't think so. And you have to bring something. You have to bring some money or some power, or at the very least, <laughs> evidence of their spectacular divorce. And he, he was not able to do that. And so you, you have a guy who had a, a veto-proof majority and manages to pass Mitt Romney's health care plan. That doesn't sound like a guy who'd been really part of the machine to me. So moving on then to your next game, and this is Pendragon. And how closely does this game follow, and now my, my French is appalling, um, Le Mort d'Artour? Is it is it close to it or does it veer away from it in many ways? I mean, Pendragon is a, is a summa of the entire Arthurian corpus. Greg Stafford was a massive Arthurian scholar. His... He, I mean, he had his own um, uh, basically translation of the Mort d'Arthur uh, that he used, but he used the Vulgate, he used the German Grail texts, he used the Welsh legends when he could, he used the Mal- uh, the uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth. He built Pendragon out of all of Arthur. The Mort d'Arthur is, I think, the spine of it because it's the version of the myth, the sort of the finalized version of the myth that we are all very familiar with as 20th century game consumers, 21st century now. Um, but it, it sort of, it takes the Mort at one place, but it's also got, you know, uh, all of the rest of the, of the, of the Arthurian corpus deep within it. Um, it's, it's, it's not just Mort Dartha, the role-playing game is, I guess what I'm saying. Uh, and I mean, it's Pendragon. And how does the game avoid, you know, the sort of, I try to read, I, I sometimes try to read fantasy books that aren't Tolkien, and they seem to me like watered-down versions of Tolkien. How does this avoid the customary fantasy tropes that occur in other RPGs? Because it's about King Arthur. It's not about fantasy fiction, right? I mean, it's about a, the, a, a, a corporeal legend of Western civilization. I mean, it's not about someone's stupid doorstop you know, fantasy trilogy or septology or whatever the hell. No, it, it's, it's about big, important things. And it's about names you recognize, like King Arthur and Sir Lancelot. It's not Glypto and Tripto or, you know, whatever the hell. These are big, important, real names that matter. Um, it's, it's, I mean, and again, plenty of people love fantasy, fine. Plenty of people love heroin. I'm not here to criticize, but I'm going to say that King Arthur is valuable and important in a way that, you know, Dave Eddings isn't. And so how revolutionary is this idea that you don't really control a character per se in that you control houses, generations, and, you know, generations can die off and you go on to control the grandson of the grandfather you did before? I mean, it's it's hugely revolutionary, and it's so revolutionary that no one has done it after Greg, really. Um, I, I think Greg Stolze did a little bit of that in Rain, but the notion that generational play is core activity is something that only Pendragon, I think, has the scope 
uh, and and is interested in playing out. Um, I mean, it's revolutionary in a lot of ways. It's, it has the passions mechanic in which a character is at war in themselves between chastity and lust. And it's not a question of, oh, I, I helped the old woman. No, you have to decide, am I greedy or am I charitable? And and those dice are going to come in and, they, and your passions are going to control you in a way that happens in both life and in literature. Um, and then also, I mean, talk about difference from fantasy. You can't play a magician in Pendragon, right? I mean, how revolutionary is that? You're only Arthurian knights. <laughs> That's your character class. And then so you have to, individu- the individuality has to come from play. And from the glory and from what you do on the table. And that's amazing. Uh, so many ways that, that that's a revolutionary generational play. Certainly one of them. Uh, and uh, that's why I specified when I show up with Pendragon under one arm, I've got the great Pendragon campaign under the other arm. And, uh, and Pendragon, again, a top five role playing game, I think, by anyone's estimation. Just an amazing game uh, that, that you can play, you know, at least uh, for 500 years of, of or 150 years of game time. Uh, regardless of how long it takes you at the table. And I mean, what, what's really interesting when I was reading about Pendragon is it occurred to me that aging is so rarely used in RPGs, that your characters sort of remain eternally as you created them. Do you think... Yeah, that's because they're fantasies, hmm. they're, and they're power fantasies specifically. I mean, do you think it can be used to add a heft to games, a sort of creeping death as opposed to an instant one? I mean, I, I, it clearly can because it is in Pendragon. Um, I think that you have to decide you're making a game about that topic in a way. Otherwise, it does just distract you. I mean, if you were playing, again, let's let's take my game. Let's not pick on somebody else. But if you're playing Knights Black Agents, um, this is an action thriller game. Uh, you should not have to say, well, Jason Bourne has been alive for 15 years and he had a bunch of very dangerous surgery. I'm going to have to start rolling for arthritis. That's not what the game's about. The game's about being Jason Bourne. And maybe uh, in, a, in a world where you're playing a game like that, you might say, now that Jason Bourne is super old, um, you're at minus two to everything just because it's harder. And that, But that, in theory, by then, you're, you've become so good at facing the challenges of the game that that's just another challenge in the same sort of, you know, every, every, every time, you know, they make a Rambo movie or they make a Dirty Harry movie, those characters aren't affected by age, even if you see them sitting there going, I'm very old. But when it comes down to, you know, gunning down bad guys, it's not like, you know, Dirty Harry misses or Rambo doesn't get his bad guys. That's just the way the characters are. Even the Batman that's about aging... Uh, Dark Knight is about overcoming it, not about its real effect on you. Um, very, very few iconic heroes of the sort that we play in role-playing games suffer from that. I mean, even Wrath of Khan, which is actually about aging, ends with Captain Kirk being given the gift of eternal youth as captain of a starship, right? And literally the gift of eternal youth as, oh, we've made an eternally youthful planet with a magic space machine. I mean, that, that, that movie is... Aging is the problem, and because you're Captain Kirk, you can cheat. But it's not about aging in the way that, say, um, uh, uh, Unforgiven is a little bit about aging, or, or other movies are. So I want to talk now about the future. So so what do you have coming up, both in gaming and other forms of writing? Uh, I'm Right now, as we speak, I'm finishing out Tour to Lovecraft, uh, The Destinations, which is the second volume in my Tour to Lovecraft series. I kickstarted it just before being hired to be the uh, designer of Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition, and my Kickstarter backers have been very lovely about being very patient while I went away to play with vampires and ignore them for a year. But now I think that they (laughs) quite rightly would like their book, and so I have to finish it and then give it to them. And then right after that, I'll be doing a game called Hellenistica, which is uh, a 5th Edition campaign setting and rule book for games set in a good parts version, a bright colored, super inflected version of the Hellenistic era of the third century BC. Uh, And so you are characters, you might be Greeks or Amazons or from India or from Carthage or from Rome, if you're boring and weird. Um, uh, And and you are in a place and time that is the most like a role-playing setting that has ever been on the earth because there's monsters over every hill there's guys in the cities who have magic that will resurrect you. There's gods that 
play a major part in your life. There's even bags of gold because Alexander the Great has blown open the Persian monetary economy and no one has yet gathered up all the gold again. Um, uh, you, there's a common human language from the Straits of Gibraltar to the Ganges Valley. So if you've got a, a if you're good at stabbing someone, you can build yourself up and become a king in a way that never happens or very seldom happens uh, at any other time. It's just a great time uh, for a fantasy game. And the fact that no one has done that since Jason and the Argonauts, uh, both Apollonius of Rhodes's version and Ray Harryhausen's version tells me there's a hole there. And I just, you know, that's what I want to do. So uh, we're, I'm doing that with uh, John Hodgson, who's doing the art uh, and through his uh, company, Handiwork Games. And uh, we are going to start working on that pretty much the instant I get done with Tour de Lovecraft and uh, crank over into producing Hellenistica, and we hope to kickstart that uh, this year. And sort of financial considerations aside, is there some great Meister work that you'd like to complete one day? Well, I mean, when I proposed Dracula Dossier to Simon back in, I think, 2011, I think it was even before uh, I'd done Nice Black Agents yet, um, I did not know that was going to be a masterwork. I just thought it was going to be good. And then Gareth Hanrahan comes on board and you can't be less than Gareth. That's, I mean, you can, cause he's amazing, but you can't let him see you be less than Gareth. So I think he really inspired me and pushed me. And then Kat Tobin, of course, managing the project did uh, a lot of inspiring and, and a lot of pushing. And the result was, I think one of those things that's up there with massive Nirlathotep or great Pendragon campaign is a really, uh, as a magnum opus, like you say, and having done one of them and, and knowing how hard it is on the one hand, I kind of have like a Tarantino attitude. I'll do four more of these and then I'll be done. But on the other hand, you're like, Oh my God, I, I, do I have four more of those in me? I mean, just t in terms of time, much less in terms of inspiration or skill or anything else. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's things that I'd like to, to do that are giant and enormous, uh, and that are hopefully, uh, big and successful, but, at the moment, you know, you'll, you'll do a thing and you won't know that when I did day after Ragnarok and when I did key long, I did those sort of as little amuse bouche games to just clear my palate, get an idea out of my head. And then both of those, you know, hit very, very big. And a lot of people played them and loved them. So I could go back and do, uh, the sequel to day after Ragnarok, you know, 500 years after Ragnarok. Um, I'd like to do that. And if I did it, does that retroactively now mean it's gotta be a big giant, uh, thing like Dracula dossier, or can it just be another little one like Day After Ragnarok? I don't know, because I don't know what the audience is. And that's another part of it is very seldom do you create, at least in this field, in isolation. I mean, I know that Thomas Pynchon hides out in his in his other apocalypse cabin and produces a masterpiece of a novel every seven years or whatever it is, and he doesn't care what anyone thinks. He's Thomas Pynchon. And it'd be great to be able to do that, but in role-playing game, and certainly post-Kickstarter, you have to find the audience. You have to be doing something that people want. Um, uh, no one is going to, uh, you know, publish it just because you're Thomas Pynchon. Um, and so, uh, being part of that conversation at, at conventions and at, at, with my colleagues is, is a big part of it. So right now I've got some ideas for stuff that'd be fun to do. And some of it might take off and be great. And some of it might be big and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, uh, magnificent like Dracula dossier turned out to be. And some of it might just be, you know, going to the, going to the office and getting it done. And so what do you think your contribution has been? And what do you think your legacy will be to the world of gaming? Oh, God knows. I mean, I'm going to be a footnote in, you know, the history of, of Vincent Baker and Greg Stafford. Probably it'll be like, Hey, he interviewed Greg Stafford. He's a primary source. So I'll be in the index but I don't know if anyone's going to be writing a comprehensive history of role-playing game uh, design and have a chapter of the height years. Um, I would like to uh, do what I can just as a connector and as a guy who knows a bunch of people to make Chicago a center for streaming games, just because we have so much cheap loft space and so many great, but unemployed actors. And it seems like that's a resource that we could turn into stuff. Um, uh, Darcy Ross, who, who lives like a block from me is, is going to be the, the, the greatest thing in the history of the medium. It's going to be the Darcy Ross biography that I'm, that I am going to get a, a big chunk of the index in. But, um, uh, 
once she is able to sort of come into her full power, uh, she's going to revolutionize the way that, that people uh, interact with streaming and all in a great way. She's going to be the Lucille Ball of this damn medium. Um, but uh, but I would like that maybe to be my legacy, not necessarily, oh, he also did a cool Dracula game. I mean, because that's something that literally will live after you. And unless, again, you're H.P. Lovecraft or Shakespeare, you know, writing in the sense that, oh, what will generations think? Well, first of all, it's a great way to never write anything. And second of all, you're fooling yourself. And that generations ignore you. Robert W. Chambers is known for four short stories, and he wrote 88 novels and was a bestseller for two decades. You, you, can't, you can't know this stuff. So your last game, then, is the Rider Weight Tarot. So why are you taking this to the cabin, and why this particular iteration of the tarot deck? All right, part of it is just because it's the, ga- it's the game of figuring out the five games. It's like, what if no one brought a deck of cards? What if everyone is so excited about bringing, you know, Charter House, uh, Charter House or Azul or um, uh, Seven Wonders or Civilization, and no one, no one brought a deck of cards, and we can't play poker? But I don't want to just bring a deck of cards because th- fine. Uh, so I thought, if I bring the Rider Weight, you can play cards with it. You can just separate out those fifty-two, knock yourself out, or you can play you know, uh, cards with the extra, uh, uh, court card, or you can do tarot readings. You can play role-playing games with tarot. Uh, Everway, of course, is, is maybe the classic example, but there's lots of games that rather than having, uh, and this is sort of in your earlier question about free forming, rather than having the dumb dice decide, you flip over a tarot card and you're like, Ooh, what does that mean? Uh, that's the tower. That was probably a bad thing. Or that's the 10 of swords. That's really a bad thing. Or it's like, Oh, the ace of cups. That means we find love. Good for us. Um, and so you can, you can use them as a, as a free form resolution system. Um, and why that one? It's just my favorite one. It, 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 this is what you were talking about sentiment. This is the tarot deck that we had when I was a kid. And so when I first knew about tarot cards, they, we had a very nice, uh, uh oversized, t- uh, rider weight deck. And, it, and I spent, I don't know how much of my misspent youth, just looking at them and playing with them and laying them out and just sort of being fond of them. And I think that they are objectively a, a lovely, lovely uh, artifact. Pamela Coleman Smith is an amazing artist and did a great job. Uh, what must have been the most nightmarish job any artist has ever had is getting notes from A.E. Waite and saying, uh, he should be left-handed and there should be nine thorns on that for Rosicrucian reasons. And it's like, oh God, just leave me alone. So that must have been a process. But the end result is is just a triumph of beautiful Edwardian design. Uh, over and above its, you know, whatever its virtues may be as a, as a tarot deck. And, I mean, you, you seem to me to be a, in, in, the, in the positive sense, a sceptical individual. But have you ever experienced anything uncanny when dealing with this tarot deck? Not really. I mean, there's, uh, the thing is, uncanniness is an emergent phenomenon of a human being. Um, and so you can be in a creepy old house, and if you're thinking about your problems with your wife, you're never going to be seeing a ghost because you're distracted. You've got other shit going on. Um, but if you're in a, a creepy old house with John Tynes and you're both egging each other on, you're going to have all kinds of uncanny feelings because it's an emergent property. And so if you are playing, as I have many, many role-playing games in which tarot decks are an, el- an element and you flip over the card and it super matches what's going on or it sets up a really great story element, your instinct is not, we're amazing. Your instinct is our, the cards are spooky, right? Because that's just how brains work. Um, so yeah, I've had, oh my God, that was such an amazing, co- that was such an amazing thing that the cards revealed, but it didn't do that. You were there, you revealed it. Um, so no, I've never had, you know, I've never summoned a demon with a, with a tarot deck. First of all, you wouldn't summon a demon with a tarot deck. That's what Ouija boards are for. But um, but no, I mean, I've, I've had moments where, you are sort of lost in the art of that artifact or you're lost in the ritualistic experience, but it's not the same thing as I turned over the tarot deck and it said I was going to meet a tall, dark stranger and travel across the sea. And then Mike Pondsmith hired me to go to England. That's never happened. I mean, if Mike Pondsmith wants to hire me to go to England, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you, Mike, but I don't think that is likely. I don't think there's a lot of work in England at the moment, apart from sort of picking up the charred bodies. So. <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 that's a good trade. You know, you shouldn't you shouldn't necessarily um, uh, knock the charred body guys. They're doing they're doing what they can. So, one last question then: 
you're heading to the cabin, you're herring down the road, 88 miles an hour. You go around the corner, the back seat of the car flies open. Four of the games fly out down a ravine into a river and are swept away to posterity. Which game do you hope is sitting on the back seat of the car? Um, well, first of all, Pendragon is strapped in in the driver's seat with me, right? It's right there in the in the in the passenger seat. It's got its own little belt. I'm not letting Pendragon out um, uh, that, that, because it's just it, it's a it's a masterpiece and it's everything that you need in in life and experience for all the reasons that I talked about. Um, and again, maybe that's just because I was lucky enough to be friends with Greg Stafford, and so just having that game reminds me of Greg, but also. It's just so good and it's so rich and so important. And, you know, I love all those other games, but if I never think about Nazis ever again, and I can only think about Grail Knights, obviously that's the good choice. Well, Kenneth Hyde, thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me on, man. And if you want to suggest a guest, or if you want to say something nice about the show, or if you want to say something horrible about the show, you can contact me on at 5 games for doomsday on Twitter, or you can send me an email at 5 games for doomsday at gmail.com. You can give a rolling donation to help support the show at patreon.com forward slash 5 g for d or a one-time PayPal donation at the bottom of the website 5 games for doomsday.com. If you feel like looking swanky, you can go to tpublic.com forward slash user forward slash five games for doomsday and pick up a t-shirt. And if I haven't had to flee the encroaching heat death of the universe and the knowledge that I'll never be rich, I'll see you in two weeks for another five games for doomsday. <laughs> <laughs>